Hello and welcome everyone. I am really glad to be here again at Product School talking to you um, about a topic that's another topic that's actually pretty close to my heart. And I think it's it's really important and I'm passionate about it. Um, a few months back, I talked about um, how to use understanding and storytelling as two core skills in the product management career and how to form your narrative as someone who's getting into product. But today I brought a, a topic that's uh, getting more into the weeds of product, the product craft. Um, I'm here to talk to you about how to develop a good amount of user understanding very early in the product development process, actually before you start building. That's pretty important. And, uh, and how to do that in a lower resource and a higher resource way. I brought you a graph about the double, double diamond framework. Uh, and I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the double diamond uh, framework before. It's pretty largely adopted by uh, design teams in the product development process. It's a really useful, useful frame of thinking about how to approach solving problems uh, through this, like uh, that this represented by the diamonds, the divergence and the convergence model. Uh, this actually originally set up by a linguist um, where the di uh, widening and the diverging parts of the diamond represent a process of exploring an issue more widely and more deeply. And the converging part then represents taking focused action. So today we'll dive a little bit deeper into the first half of the first diamond. Um, this piece of the process is called the discover phase. And it's all about understanding rather than assuming uh, what's the problem that you're trying to solve. And I want to talk to you about tools that you can use in the process of discovery. Um, uh, and then they actually discover phase, the first half of the first diamond. Um, I'll walk you through the methods I've been using for years to, to improve user understanding. These worked for me at my time at a Series A startup, um, and as well as, as building products currently with Spotify. It's an especially important distinct, distinction between a, a startup or a more um, established company, because I've experienced this crappy kind of like low budgety way of doing things. And I've also experienced like having more resources to dedicate into this process and having a dedicated research team. So every method that I'll show you, I'll talk about a low resource and a higher resource uh, alternative, as you can see uh, next to the diamond. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I, I mean, it's it's important to, to, um, to ask, like, why is it important that we approach it this way? Why do I think it's important to approach user research or user understanding from a resource standpoint? But actually, because, what I really want you to take away from this presentation is that you don't need to have a long time to dedicate to this you know, user research process or, and or a huge budget of, of dedicated researchers, researchers to do it. And especially at startups in an early growth stage, there tends to be kind of like a misbelief that user research is a luxurious thing. And I actually believe, firmly believe that the exact opposite is, is true of this. It's a luxury not to do it. So why do I say that? Um, because investing time into research will help you to understand whether you're building the right thing. And this process, even if it's lengthy, will be so much cheaper than building the wrong thing and having to throw out weeks and months of hard work just because you were kind of convinced in the beginning that your that that your solution or your you know, the, that you're building the right thing and your solution is going to work. You need to test your hypothesis. You need to look at your ideas from different angles and you need to uh, probably need to do a lot of user research in order to build the right thing uh, for the right people um, addressing real user needs. So I hope I will be able to show you how to discover in, uh, in a low resource way as well, be able to convince you to do this. Um, but before we jump in, let me just quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Kinga Ashbot. I've been working as a product manager at Spotify for the last uh, nearly two years. Before that, I worked at the B2B SaaS startup. I got into product there and uh, that's called Impraise. And before I transitioned into a PM role, um, I worked in, a, uh, in the customer relations team, actually. Um, and worked with uh, uh, in the customer support and customer success teams. Um, I studied psychology and I had a brief kind of adventure as an entrepreneur um, as well. 
And these two, I actually consider like kind of key transforming me into someone who is really focused and, and passionate about delivering user value. And to be honest, I'm also kind of strict about this too. Um, if I, you know, if I think that if that ever happens that I think that we don't have like uh, the right user needs like narrowed down and properly mapped out and understood, I'll always push back building a solution. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what user understanding is. Um, so simply put, it's understanding the different needs, pains, annoyances, desires, constraints, et cetera, of the people that you're trying to build your product for. This is especially important to do before you start building and base your decisions on assumptions and, and uh, potential biases uh, that you might have about your users. Um, so not that we have this, this, the, the definition. Uh, I know many of you are thinking, um, you know, especially that I talk about like a design framework, double diamond, you know, uh, like you might think, wait a minute, why am I, whose responsibility is this? Like, isn't this the design team? Um, and that's a very fair question. Um, and there still tends to be a concept that in-depth user understanding is only the design team's responsibility. And to be honest, I just couldn't disagree with it more. As a product manager, you're ultimately accountable for your product success. And your product success is firmly grounded in how well it can deliver user value. And how could it deliver user value without you understanding your users' needs, th their circumstances, their behavioral patterns, who they are and what jobs they're considering hiring your product or solution for? So I'm here to, to make a case that developing user understanding is best done with you as a product manager involved, if not actually driving it. Usually your design folks will be very involved in the process too, and they bring on expertise that will be really helpful, really, really helpful in doing user discovery and structuring information that you collect by your users. But you know, the, the PM should always be involved. And, and in some situations where the company doesn't really have like resources or to, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't know, budget to, to found uh, user research, you as the PM can very much pick this up and, and you can actually drive this. So with that said, let's drive into the methods that I brought to you today to begin this process. So the first one um, is interviews. And it's always a great idea to start with conducting interviews. If you have already uh, a good business problem that you want to solve, and if you just want to validate it, or if you're searching for like, you know, very wide discovery, just searching for meaningful problems to solve uh, in your potential user lives. Interviews are a great tool to, uh, to kick this process off. So yeah, let's talk about stakeholder interviews first. So this is the process when you schedule calls with your business and customer stakeholders and try to unlock their knowledge, their perspective, their insights, and I dare to say, yes, even ideas. I'm 100% sure that they will be kind of thrilled to talk to you about their opinion and they will grab uh, every chance that you give to them uh, to share their insight and knowledge as, as well as possible. After all, these are the people who interact with your customers or, or your potential customers, actually, regularly. They feel the customer's needs and pains and they interact with them and they see, you know, how you're a product is being used and and, uh, and and they kind of use your product sometimes rather similarly as an external user would. Uh, so they usually have like very well-informed feedback and good ideas. And what usually these need to be like filtered and refined and, you know, to, to get to the root problem. It's a great resource of information to start the exploration of potential problems to solve. But stakeholder interviews are more a process of a one interviewer and a, a one or a few interviewees. There's another tool I love to use that's very similar to this, but it's kind of a, a little bit different and it's called uh, lightning or expert interviews. Um, during the lightning interviews, you invite an expert and ask them questions about their area of knowledge. For instance, you can invite a, a customer support representative and ask about what they see the biggest bottlenecks of the process, processes that, that, or the, the product that users go through. 
you can invite marketing or sales team members, your uh, business and data insights team, anyone and everyone basically who might have a unique perspective uh, on your users and the space that you're working in. Um, what I actually really love about this process is that it's very fast and it's very concentrated. Um, that's why it's called lightning interviews actually. Um, also, instead of like you asking questions, uh, you can invite and you're actually encouraged to invite the entire product team and have them ask uh, questions while you're kind of just in the background moder moderating the, the conversation. Your product team uh, will write down uh, how might we questions um, of the insights that they, they're gathering. So, for example, when the expert mentions, I often see people reaching out to us, asking, um, asking us to send them their invoices. Um, your product team might note down how might we make it easier for users to download their invoices in a softer way. Um, I actually lifted this uh, exercise from uh, from the design sprint or Google's design sprint. Um, if you haven't heard about the design sprint, I highly recommend you to check it out. It's a few days long process to drive from problems to solution. It's a brilliant fast paced tool for all product teams to use to test their ideas. Lightning interviews and the how, how might we questions are part of the uh, the understand phase of the de design interview. And that might sound a little bit familiar, thinking back of the uh, double diamond and uh, you know the, the, the part that we're talking about, this cover phase. Um, and you know, it, it's part of, of the design um, sprint, but uh, but as I said, I use it on its own too. And I really believe that it's a great tool on its own as well. Um, and obviously this is like a really low resource way of learning about your user problems. And you know, all you need is to block some time out um, and, and invite people who might actually be very enthusiastic and happy to talk to you about um, their experience and knowledge. Um, so, Let's talk about uh, another very obvious method or interview method, uh, is, which is conducting user interviews. Um, I don't really want to get super deep into this. User interviews is kind of like an art on its own. Um, but the point here is to urge you to go ahead, read about it, and I really encourage you to try it out. You can start these interviews like really wide and not focused on any topic. Uh, you can talk to your potential existing users. It's a good, it's it's kind of like good. To, it's a good method to talk to a variety of users, and it's actually good to keep in mind to talk to uh, different users from like uh, in terms of like their background and demographic, age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so here I brought you some examples. So I don't know. Let's just assume that you want to uh, conduct some user interviews about shopping habits uh, and you kind of suspect that there might be a pain with grocery shopping. So you can start really wide and ask the question, how do you feel when you think about having to do grocery shopping? Um, what do you typically do before you leave? Or, um, you know, what do you find painful and annoying when you do and when you're doing your shopping? We'll talk, walk me through a time when you were faced with uh, not enough, not having enough time or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of like keeping it wise. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, these questions are also like very broad. Uh, and it's great to start off this way, especially if you don't have like a firm idea already what to, what to work on. And it's also a good place to be when you don't have a firm idea. Um, you can later narrow your questions down further to understand um, a more specific problem. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, urge you to be curious and keep an open mind in this process. Um, follow up with clarifying questions when, when necessary. And uh, yeah, I, I actually use interviewing a lot in my career. Um, we do this at Spotify a lot too. It's, um, it's actually invaluable, I think, to talk to real life people facing certain problems um, or, you know, people who actually use your product. Um, and you can scope your interview uh, phase to be as big or small as you want it to be. You can make it like kind of, you know, scrappy and, and do it yourself, or you could hire user researchers too. It's actually really up to you. And, you know, I've, I've done, actually done both. I went out to talk to like potential users on the streets before. I sent out tons of emails, like begging for a chance to offer a call. 
Um, but I've also worked with like user researchers and felt like I'm in like sitting the most <laughs> questioned sofa while digesting user insights. Um, so really, no matter your resources, I really encourage you to talk to experts, um, your stakeholders, and your users. Um, and maybe another thing to add here, and this is something that I've actually taken from my experience working as a psychologist, is that people actually love talking about themselves. Um, so let them, let them. They will share a lot of their ideas, problems, concerns, all you need to do is to listen and you organize your findings and you'll have so many ideas, so many, it can spark so many good ideas how to uh, solve problems and what problems to solve. Um, I really encourage you to do this and listen to people. Cool. Um, uh, organizing uh, the, or speaking, the, I just spoke about like organizing these findings and uh, you know, a great way to, to organize um, findings. And once you actually gathered a lot of like great insights through these interviews, um, you will, I think you'll start noticing that they already kind of naturally fall into distinguishable categories when it comes to your users. So the next logical step is to group them and uh, create representations of your user groups. Um, the high resource approach to, to uh, creating representations of your user groups are creating archetypes um, and uh, or personas with the help of your design team. But what are archetypes and how are they different from personas? Well, archetypes are behavioral perspectives of a user towards a specific product. These representations uh, contain user needs and behavioral patterns and other important vectors that align a group of users together. And then on the other hand, personas are fictionalized and hypothetical characters that represent segments of a user base and are built around more about like the demographic, demographic details such as age, occupation, um, education, etc. Um, you might have seen these before, actually. They, they sometimes even have a name, or often they even have a name and, and a gender attached to them, uh, as opposed to archetypes that are really like wide and don't have these demographic details attached to them. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, archetypes are more behavioral constructs, and they're uh, and and uh, they are be, they, they're more task oriented as well. Um, so obviously the, the, the question is which one uh, you would set up. And um, I, I would say that it really depends on what you need. Um, behavioral patterns, you know, show how people are using your product. And, you know, while personas give insight into the people who are using your product. So behavioral versus characteristic is really the takeaway uh, from this one. I've used personas in the past and they were really great to think about delivering user value for like more personal user needs. Um, but I also really, really love archetypes um, and I find them to really to be really easy to work with. I think they're prompting great problem thinking without the personal touch. Um, at Spotify, we actually use both archetypes and personas, which back, backs up my, my statement about, you know, it really depends on what you're needed for. Currently, I'm working more with archetypes, actually, um, and it's uh, it's a really it's really helpful to to kind of constantly anchor the way that we're thinking about problems to solve uh, to the people that we're solving for, um, and uh, and so it's a great method. I, I really recommend that. But if there's one thing that I learned about using both personas and archetypes is that you need to constantly constantly work on them. Um, so yeah, whether you choose archetypes or persona, setting them up and perfecting them are a lot of work. You probably need a lot of like help from your design or insights team. You're probably gonna uh, spend a lot of time doing research as well, which is actually great if you have a lot of time and resources um, uh, before you can actually use these things. But what if you don't? What if you need something kind of right away? Well, then I recommend you the lower, low resource alternative of this, the proto personas. Um, you remember what I said about the low resource interview method to talk to your stakeholders? 
Well, product personas are descriptions of your target users and the customers of your product based on these assumptions from stakeholders. This is a very useful method to be, build alignment in the um, early discovery phase between teams. Um, uh, and, you know, it allows like the product team to start designing and building without feeling kind of paralyzed by not really understanding who the users are. And I've actually seen that happen a lot of times. Um, and this is a really, really useful little method to like unlock that, uh, that feeling of, of being paralyzed. Um, and it's important to keep refining product personas as well. So I'm definitely not saying that you should stick with them, um, you know, later on when you will have like some more uh, occasions, but you'll do user research, user interviews, you can build this and you can iterate these into archetypes and personas. Um, so yeah, in that sense, product personas also require constant requ uh, refinement. Um, and it is a lot of work, but with product personas, you can just get started kind of right away. Um, and also it's important to keep in mind that this, this process of iterating, that's also what makes them useful. In the beginning, you might have a lot of assumptions and uh, you might, you know, work these assumptions into a persona or an archetype. And later you can refine or swap these like assumptions out with the knowledge that you gathered during your user discovery. Um, so these are the tools that I brought to you today uh, to develop early user understanding and making sure that when you start building, you're actually solving a key problem or pain point for a certain group of users. And I hope that you were able to get this message out of this presentation that you don't need to have a lot of time or a huge budget to bring your user understanding to the next level. And before I say goodbye to you today, I just wanted to mention one more thing about this you know, low resource, high resource um, topic. It might be a little bit unusual, but I actually believe that sometimes it's much better to do things this crappy way. It brings you as the product manager much closer to the problem than when you have these insights delivered to you you know, you, you can actually take this chance to interact with your users and develop a much better connection to the problems itself for themselves. It also makes you and the, and the team more invested in, in, in the success. It makes it easier to empathize with your users because you're interact with, interacting with them face-to-face. Uh, -face. It reinforces the, the team feeling of working for something impactful and meaningful if you involve your, your product team in the process, which sometimes you have to do when you do things crappy. Um, so there are a lot of great takeaways from doing it this crappy way. And obviously this can be done with the right ways of distributing research insights. Um, so even if you have like, um, uh, you know, a dedicated research findings and you're having like an executive brief of the, the research findings, you can still uh, distribute these insights um, in, in your team. And that's basically, uh, it has to be done. But it's maybe it's a bit more natural when you and your team is also part of the, the uh, user discovery process. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this quick talk and I really, really hope that it inspires you to do more user discovery, to build the right thing, even if you don't have the budget uh, to do something fancy. Thank you so much.